Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded. We'll share a link to the recording and you can revisit the recording at any time. You can submit text questions during the presentation and presenters will answer um, the questions at the very end of the webinar. Throughout the webinar, we may ask you a few, a few poll questions. We encourage you to participate in these. And at the end of the webinar, we will launch a survey and we'd love your input on today's webinar and any future webinar topics. If you experience issues throughout the webinar, you can use the help button located at the top of the control panel. On the upper right hand side of your screen, you should also see a widget bar. You can click help for an online technical help if you need, if you get stuck throughout the webinar. To make slides larger, please click the full screen button. And if any time during the webinar you need to ask a question, please enter it in the questions box. If we're unable to get through all the questions during the live session, someone will be reaching out to you after the webinar by email. Now I'm going to turn it over to our presenters to introduce themselves and I'll start with Sam. So all over to you, Sam. Thanks, Tamara. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for tuning in. As Tamara said, my name is Sam Hesper. I work with CR Kennedy in Australia, particularly the Melbourne office, and I have a background as a surveyor. Uh, for anyone who's not aware, CR Kennedy is the authorised distributor for Leica Geosystems products throughout the country. Uh, we pride ourselves on the, on the service and support, and um, it's always interesting when there's a new product that, that's being released uh, as is the case now with the blk to go um, laser scanning is always an interesting and fast moving industry uh, and i i definitely enjoy working with these new products so hopefully you get something out of this this presentation i should say that greg and i are both doing this from home so if there's any background noise uh, any dogs barking or anything like that apologies in advance hopefully there's not um, over to you, Greg. Thanks, Sam. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here once again. And certainly hello to everyone across the Tasman in New Zealand and those attending from the world. Um, I really enjoy these sessions. It's always a, a, a fun time to, to show what's new and what's what's exciting and what's happening. Um, I've been involved in, in non-contact measurement for a number of years. And uh, yeah, it's like Sam just said, it's uh, it's always exciting when we when we talk about new products such as the BLK to go. So with that, I think we'll continue tomorrow. Sounds good. So in terms of what we're covering today, we'll kick off with a bit of an introduction on the blk to go and an overview. Then we'll look at an example. More specifically, we'll be looking at field capture using blk to go and we'll be looking at an office space here in Melbourne. Then we'll look at reviewing project data in Leica Cyclone Register 360. And then Sam will take you through another multi-level car park example. Then we'll explore look, uh, managing and collaborating, looking at um, Jetstream Viewer, Jetstream Enterprise, and also Cloudworks for AutoCAD and Revit. Then we'll have a discussion about some exciting applications for the blk to go and we'll conclude, conclude the webinar with a Q&A session. Now I will hand you over to Greg. Thanks, Tamara. Um, so yes, the BLK to go is the, the next addition to our BLK lineup. So we can see that we have the BLK 3D, the BLK 360, and as well as the new BLK to go. And it's a, it's a, it's the new latest addition to our reality capture devices. You can see we have a number of different devices that really are designed to, to speed up your reality capture workflows. We also have a number of different softwares to really get you from the field to finish as fast as possible and we'll be presenting that a bit further later on. When I first saw this graphic I, I didn't quite understand it until I actually started to use the BLK to go it really is reality capture in your hands and that's why we have that little graphic of a of a point cloud and as Sam will show shortly you you do see uh, as you move around, you're capturing the 3D space. It's dimensionally accurate. We're using a, a number of different technologies, um, such as SLAM and, and our vis, vi, uh, visual inertial system. And if I click on here shortly, no, tomorrow, there we go. 
the device itself, uh, it's a two axis LiDAR. So we'll show you that in a second. It has a number of, well, it has three detail, three visual cameras, I should say. It has one high res decal camera. It's a one button device. So same as the BLK360, very easy to use. You can easily change out the batteries. And to transfer data, you can either use Wi-Fi or a USB-C cable as well. Uh, can you just go forward tomorrow? Thanks. So you can see the, the one button there. You can see where we add the batteries into the handle. It's uh, The design is really, really interesting. Um, very lightweight, very easy to use. We have the dual axis light out, which means not only is the, the mirror spinning in the vertical plane, but it's also spinning around horizontally. You can see we have a, a, a high resolution detail camera, as well as three panoramic images, which are, are continually capturing as you, as you move around. So with that, I'll hand over to Sam and he will uh, start to give you the more information on how to use it. Thanks, Greg. Just while Tamara's loading up this little video for us, um, I thought it'd, everyone's pretty excited to see how you actually collect the data with the blk to go So I put together a little video. Um, if you can hit play on that now, Tamara. Thank you. So yeah, I put together this little video. Um, the screen is split into two. On the left, you can see what the user would see on the blk to go Live app. So this is an optional thing. You don't have to use this app during field collection, um, but it certainly helps. And in a moment on the right side of the screen, you'll see a recording of myself in a room and, and the scanner is sitting on the desk in the desk mount, as is how you start the survey with this one. Uh, I've just pressed the button on the side, the single push button, and it takes about 10 seconds to initialize. And then the, the screen on the smart device, in my case, I'm using an iPhone, starts to show you the environment around you through the point cloud. And that's a top-down view that we're looking at at the moment. So it's a super easy field capture process. And as I move through the environment, you'll see the points, the map starting to populate just transition through that doorway and you can see the, the room I've come from and the room that I've gone, I'm going to and that I'm in now. Uh, on the side, there is a vertical scroll bar which can control the, the clip of what you're looking at. At any moment, if you wanna take a detailed photo, you just press the button on the side briefly like so and it takes a photo. You can also jump into the 3D view mode during the field collection on the app, which is shown, shown now. And this, this is pretty cool. This allows you to see the environment around you as you're actually scanning and collecting the data in 3D. I've jumped back to the 2D top-down view now, and I'm going to continue walking past these stairs and come out into a, an open room, which we'll touch on it a little bit later as well when we register another walk or another scan to this particular one. I should mention it's capturing imagery continuously throughout the capture. And we'll see those in a short while. But in addition to those images, like I said, you can take these high res detail shots with the 12 megapixel camera on the front at any particular, particularly important locations. And they'll come through as geotags back in the office. Walking through into the last room now, this is a kitchen area. And I just do a quick loop around. So generally holding a scanner like I am at the moment, you're gonna be capturing everything you need. Of course, you can lower it down if you need to see under net underneath desks um, and in fact you can actually turn it on the side and hold it upside down I've been told as well although I haven't had a chance to test that yet but usually just walking like this will capture uh, everything you need walls ceilings floors furniture 
all of that. And to stop the capture, you just simply press and hold the button and that's it. So I think we'll move, we'll move back to tomorrow now. We've got our first poll question. Okay, let me load that up for you. Okay, so after seeing Sam's example, how would you rate the simplicity of field capture using the BL code okay to go Please select from one of the following, extremely simple, very simple, moderately simple, difficult, very difficult. We'll give you a few moments. We seem to have an even result so far. I won't tell you what it is yet. And we'll give you a few more moments to answer that. Okay, so I'll be closing the poll now and let me launch the results. That that looks about right, Sam. I, and I, I think everyone that's that's used it or seen it being used is is really impressed with how how easy and simple it is to use. Thank yeah, I think that's a, yeah, no surprises there, Tamara. I think I would agree with that as well. It is amazingly simple to use. Great, we'll move on. Okay, thanks, Tamara. So next up, we've got a little recording of looking at that data in the office. Uh, specifically in Register 360. And we will get Tamara to load the video now, please, Tamara. Thank you. Okay, so I have a Register 360 project here, which I've just opened up. And we'll jump back to the review and optimize section. You can see there's two walks or two scans. Um, they call them walks with this BLK to go. And if we color the point cloud in the bundle view by the setup color, that will just help us see the, the two different data sets in here. So the first one is the blue one. It started up here on level three. Uh, it went down the stairs onto level two along level two and then down the stairs at one end of the building, back along ground level and up the stairs here and finish somewhere near where it started. The second data set was the one that we just saw in the video and that started over here in the sort of workshop area, it came out this way through the corridor under the stairs out into this larger room, which is common to both the green and the blue. We'll come back to that. And then we finished up in this kitchen area. For many of you, this is probably the first time you've seen some blk to go LiDAR data. And initially you'll see the scan pattern is uh, somewhat different to what you're probably used to seeing from a terrestrial scanner. Tripod mounted scanners give you a nice even radial point cloud from the tripod location. Um, this blk is a bit different. As you can see, it, because it's a mobile it's a moving platform and the laser dot is spinning around in two different axes continually. You do get um, you do get this kind of pattern as it hits the surfaces. If you need more density, you can slow down how fast you're walking. And what's important is, although it looks a little bit kind of whiskery, um, the positional accuracy of these points in the point cloud is still quite good. Let's now jump into one of these waypoints or setups. They're not really a setup because it's just a point along the trajectory path of this capture. If I turn the point cloud off, this is the typical image data. And um, I should say that there is a setting on the blk to go live app to turn the image compression on or off. At the moment, I've got the image compression on. Um, and it's normal to see this black area, this void, for obvious reasons. If we had a photo there every time, you'd see the user's face, which is not really what you want. So 
of course you can turn the point cloud on and off to see in that area or you can change your location to get a different perspective of what you want to look at these points are ex these waypoints are extracted as set interval as determined at the import stage those detail photos if you remember i took a few of those during the capture they can be seen uh, in register 360 and opened up like so and saved out in a, a normal windows picture image uh, picture editing software uh, and also we can categorize and label these geotags and this information will flow out into an LGS file format if we were to publish one of those from this project or into the Jetstream Enterprise project as well. And Greg touches more on that, talks more about that later on in the presentation. I mentioned that there's two walks in here and what I've done is register them both together through a cloud to cloud link. And I wanna show you what that looks like in the True Slicer. The True Slicer is a really cool tool. It allows you to take a really quick uh, slice, typically horizontally, but you can do it vertically as well through the data. And you can visually see the quality of your registration. So what I'm doing now is making sure I'm in the top view in ortho, orthographic mode. And now we're looking straight down on the walls. And you can see straight away that the blue and the green scans line up really nicely. So this indicates we've got a good fit between the two separate point clouds. This fit here was a shelf. So that's the sort of detail you can expect. Um, so that looks great. You can also jump over to the X or the Y axis. and do a similar thing. You can slide this scroll bar through to pick a nice location. And straight away, you can see that, that that's looking quite nice as well. So that's a really quick overview of one project with the BLK to go. I also have another one which I'd like to share with you. And this one was actually quite fitting, um, given that Anzac Day has just, just been in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, this one was the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne. And it's just a really interesting data set that I, I thought you might like. Uh, it took probably, oh, I don't know, about 10 minutes to capture. I did one walk around on the top level, around the building, and then I went down the stairs and did another loop down on the lower level. Along the way, I took some detail photos as indicated by these geotag pins. I really like how the green of the grass has come through. Of course, the point cloud is colored by the photos. Not these detail photos, but the photos that are collected along the way by default, there's a shot just looking up the stairs to the main entrance. That brings us to the conclusion of that little se section. So uh, over to you, Tamara, for our second poll question. Great, let me just load that up. Okay, so you've seen some examples of the BLK to go so far. So we'd like to know if the BLK to go could help you with one of your current projects or future projects. So please select from one of the following. Yes, you might be very sure at this stage. Two, you might you still might need to see um, some more information or data to decide. Three, you just might not be sure at this stage. And for some of you, it just might be a no. while people enter that in tomorrow sam i think uh, one of the things that that people have been really impressed with is is, is the color that is um, the colorized point clouds that's it is quite impressive you've also got some other examples of green and vibrant areas and it comes through quite nicely yeah absolutely okay so we're now closing the poll uh let me share the results with everyone
Well, that's a pretty pretty even spread again. It's good to see that there's definitely some people that can that can see that they could uh, make good use of it and and understandably people still need a bit more information. So that's that's positive. Great. And since there were a few of you that still needed to see more to decide, our uh, team is trying their best to do virtual demos at the moment. Um, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about the blk to go or any of our reality capture solutions, you can request a virtual demo uh, via the link below. You don't need to write it down now because we will be emailing this to you along with the recording. Great, that's me. So uh, thanks, Sam. That was a really good example, and we've got a, a, another really good example which which Sam walked around in. I'll just get tomorrow to, to load that up. So um, again, it's a it's a situation of of two walks, and I'll wait for tomorrow to load it up. Thanks, Tamara. So um, this is an example of uh, an indoor car park, a multi-level car park, which Sam has done. He started up there at uh, at level six, P six. And then he's walked around, he's gone down to P5, then he's walked down the ramp to, to P4, and then he continued on down to, to P3 and to P2. So it's quite a, a good little walk. And then once he got, uh, and then he started walking back up again and he actually walked into one of the stairwells. There's two stairwells in this, this car park. So he walked up the stairwell, popped out this little door here, and then walked back up the, the ramp and finished where he roughly started at, uh, at P6. Then for his second walk, he uh, started at P6 again and walked down the down the stairwell and then uh, went down uh, to P4 and then um, walked back up again, took some detail shots around the around the uh, fire hose there and then continued on his way. So that gives you a bit of an overview of 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 what the project looks like. And then we'll start. So after importing those two walks, uh, as most of us who use Register 360, you have something like this, where uh, where we have two walks. With the, as Sam said, when you import, you can decide how many waypoints you want, uh, which is determined by the distance between them. In this case, I've set that distance at three meters, so you can see where the trajectory was. One of the great things about the BLK to go is that because you can set how many waypoints you want, you can change that. So in this case, I've processed this second example where the spacing was one metre, so you end up with a lot more waypoints. And obviously, you can't do that with a tr traditional terrestrial laser scanner. So um, that is uh, one of the unique things about the BLK to go. Here, you can see that um, the, the geotags or the snapshots in the field that Sam has taken, they're, they're all populated in the, in the project, and they will be carried on downstream as well. So as uh, a lot of you are used to, to, to register these two scans together, like I'm just roughly orientating the first scan, so just squaring it up to the screen, and then I can go over to the second, the second walk and do the same thing, and I just roughly spin that around so that, the, that they're in the same orientation. And as we know that there's, there's two ways you can then start to bring these together. One is you could drag one scan over to the other one and, and you would start to see those links between the, between the walks automatically populate. Or in this case, I'm selecting one waypoint and another waypoint in the two walks using the shift button and then choosing visual alignment. And then uh, we come up with a, what's almost becoming now the classic orange and, and blue uh, data sets. You can see I've just dragged one over on top of the other. Very important to go to the side view just to see how we're lined up in the in the vertical. And you can see I can just raise or lower that so that they match up quite nicely. And then go back to the top view. I haven't lined them up perfectly because that's what the software is designed to do. I hit the, the optimize button and you can see that we have a, a good amount of overlap, about 70%, which is excellent. And now those two, two uh, walks have been joined together. And you can see we have uh, one constraint there. So like Sam talked about, one of the great things in Register 360 is the is the true slice. And I can slide this up and down. You can see these columns. Again, the, the blue and the green walks have come together quite nicely. If I move over, we can see we have good 
good lineup. There's no uh, there's no double lines, or as some people call, there's no delamination. We can see that those walls are, are coming up nicely. I can raise and lower that slice to my heart's content. You can see we have the two stairwells, one in the bottom right-hand corner and one in the top left-hand corner. And one of my favourite views is changing to a to a vertical plane. So we can move that slice through the vertical plane. And you can start to see some really interesting things. So things like where the columns are, we can see that the columns between the different floor, floor levels have lined up nicely. There's some handrails that we can see. You get to see where the different ramps transitioning between the floor levels are. We're obviously seeing the thickness of the, of the, uh, the concrete slabs. Um, and I, I, in some ways, it's a, a little bit artistic, like um, Sam talked about the, the BLK to go data. I find this is a really interesting view as well. But more importantly, it's it's giving us a, a visual check on on how well our registration has performed, which is which is really important. Then we can go back to our sitemap view. And one of the things that's uh, new, we've many of you be aware that we've made um, some new updates recently. We now have our version 2020 of softwares, um, and one of the, there's been a number of changes for for a couple of releases now. We've had this new clipping box manager. I really enjoy using this this clipping box manager, and you can see I'm just sort of isolating level six, and then I'll save that. Call it obviously P6 because that's what it is. Um, the the push pull effect which a lot of a lot of people are used to being able to do works really nicely in then uh, if you hold the shift button down you can obviously not obviously but you can select one of the 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 planes all the sides of the boxes behind i've just sped this up so uh you can not waste any time but you can see i've just i'm really isolating the the different floor plans and and this um Often when projects are done like this, the person who puts the project together has a, a good understanding. So if you do that now, it helps people downstream to easily focus in on the areas that they're interested in. So now I have uh, five clipping boxes there and that will be saved in the project to be used downstream. You can see I've turned on the intensity view here. That's one of the other interesting things about the be okay to go is that we can have a, not only colorized points, but the, or you have the intensity values as well, which can be useful sometimes to help you understand what you're looking at. You can see I've gone to the, to the report stage and I've ticked the LGS. So I want to publish an LGS file, which is our all in one file. And there's a number of settings you can choose there. We can also do a export to a, a jet stream and there's a number of other uh, deliverables we can choose, including the RCP format as well. So in this case, I've just uh, chosen to export an LGS file as well as uh, to our jet stream project. And then we can see that that was successful. So, so that's worked quite well. Many of you are using the LGS file as a, as a deliverable and then providing the free Jetstream viewer to your, to your customers and you can open up the LGS file and as I've just done here in Jetstream viewer and there's a wealth of information which comes in the LGS file such as all your geo tags, um, you can create snapshots and things like that which is which is really good for all stakeholders to be able to get access to. But what I'm going to show here today is, is using the Jetstream project or Jetstream Enterprise. So I've saved uh, the Jetstream file to, to uh, my local network. You can use it in a local network in your office or you can have it on a server somewhere so that other offices around Australia or, or the, even indeed the world can have access to that. And that has some advantages which I'll, which I'll show here. So I've just opened up the, the file from the Jetstream server. Still looks exactly the same because we're using Jetstream Viewer and all the same information is in there. I can open up one of the waypoints, we can see here that uh, as we move around, I can I'll wave over some of those geotags which Sam took in the field so we can see those, those images that he's taken. And then I can also see that those clipping boxes that are created in Register 360 are there as well. And I can, I can utilize those in the Jetstream view as well. And likewise, I'll show you how they pop up in, in Cloudworks in a second. So that's quite quite handy to know that all of that is is coming through in the downstream projects. I can go back to my site map and choose a different waypoint. And this is one of the, I'm about to show one of the, the advantages of using Jetstream. So I've opened up this, this waypoint here. I've zoomed out a little bit. So I'm looking at this, this power board here. And then I'm actually going to take a, what we call a snapshot. So I open up the snapshot tab 
and this is where you can do your markup. So there's a, a number of things that we can that we can use to, to create a markup. I can choose a, in this case a rectangle where I'm just trying to help uh, you know make a make it prominent what I want to talk about. I can add some text, you know, such as um, you know investigate this further or something like that. We have a, a number of different editing tools such as being able to change color and sizes and things like that. We can add arrows all those sorts of things that you would be expect to be able to, to do perform markups there, they're available there. So that's quite good. So because this is a Jetstream project, if I then close that, and now, as you can see, I've opened up Revit quite quickly, and I've opened up the Jetstream project in Revit. And if I open up True Space in Cloudworks, and this could be Cloudworks for AutoCAD or, or Navisworks, et cetera, same, same thing happens. I click on the point cloud, the list of uh, waypoints comes up. I choose that same waypoint that I opened up in Jetstream Viewer, and there we have it. And then when you first do this, you might get surprised because you go, well, hang on, there's no markups there, but um, to be able to see your markups, you just need to go back to your snapshots tab, and there's that markup or that, that snapshot I created in, in the viewer that's there. So that's great, and you could, if you use the LGS file, the same thing would happen. So if you created a, a, a snapshot in, in Register 360, that would be published in your LGS file. But the, the advantage of, of Jetstream, using Jetstream, is now I'm in the true space in Cloudworks in the downstream project. I've just uh, created some, some, more, some more markups and I want other people to be able to see those because it's Jetstream, that gets saved to the Jetstream project. I've now opened up Jetstream Viewer, I've accessed that same file, and then same thing again, if we go to our snapshots, I can just click on that snapshot and it'll automatically take me to that spot. And you can see that those, those changes and those additions that I've made to the Jetstream file are now populated. So it's been saved back to Jetstream. And, and that's one of the big advantages of using Jetstream, which you, which you don't get with using an LGS file. So I think that's quite, quite interesting. So now, now that we're in, in Revit, I'll use that same Jetstream file and we'll start to, to do some of the interesting things you can do in, in Cloudworks. And in this case, it's Cloudworks for Revit. So one of the first things I can show is that um, those uh, clipping boxes I created in Register 360, they're already there. So I can just activate those. And then you can see that they're, uh, they're, being, they're being utilized. So that's quite a good way to be able to, like I said, focus on the, on the area of interest. And now what I will also do, one of the, the, the clipping box manager in Cloudworks, you, you will use all the time and it really does help you, you zoom in and focus on the area that you're trying to work on. Now you can see I've created a, a quick clipping box which shows me all the, all the different levels of the car park. I can use the, uh, in the Cloudworks feature which is create a level or set a level by point. And all I've done is just click the point on the point cloud on that, on that floor level gave it a name, which is P2, and said create a floor plan at that point. And I can do the, exactly the same thing for all these other floor plans. So this is a, a very quick way to set your up your floor plans. And as we know that typically that's one of the first things that you will do in a Revit project is, is define where your floor plans are. If I go to a south elevation, we can see we've got our default ground level and, and level one, they're there. And then also those, those floor plans that I just created really quickly, they're there as well. And what I can do is I can just tidy this up just by dragging this out to the right. So it's, and you can see that all those, those floor plans are at the right level and they line up nicely with the, with the point cloud. One of the new things in, um, in uh, Cloudworks for Revit 2020 is we've got some, some new fitting tools. And I've, again, I've used the clipping box manager. You use it so much. Uh, I've just isolated uh, one of the, the columns and you can see that that goes through all the different levels. So if I, I can now use the new column fitter. And so any, any families that, uh, or column families that you have in Revit, uh, Cloudworks will utilize those. You can see I could have used a round column. In this case, I, it's a, a rectangular column. I click two points on that, on that point cloud to show where the column is. It shows me what types I have in there. Or uh, in this case, I think that, you know, it's showing me it's probably a 600 by 600 column. So I can quickly change that and create a new type automatically. So it's a, a nice quick way to, to speed things up. And then we can see that that's now fitted that, that's, that rectangular column to the point cloud using the, the families that you have in already loaded into Revit. So I can see here that uh, I forgot to create a, a level. I forgot to define a point that, um, 
in this case, I'm going to create, call it a ceiling and, and still call it a floor plan though. So it's, I can define where that column goes up to. So now I can choose that column again, say where the top level is, which is P6 ceiling. And in theory, that column should be going down to the, all the way down through the building. Um, but obviously, as we know, that buildings aren't built all in one go, they're built per level. So there might be some distances, some, some variations there. But in this case, I'm just gonna say, okay, well, choose the, the bottom level for this is down at P2. So I select P2, get rid of that little offset there and just click apply. And now that, that Revit column has gone down to P2 and we can see that that's lining up quite nicely with the point cloud. And then I've obviously shaded it as well, just to make it a bit easier. So I've just, another example of some of the new, the new features that we have, I've just isolated the, the stairwell quite quickly and I move around to a different, a different elevation. And then one of the, tool, the, the cool tools is that we can create a quick slice, in this case, a quick slice using a wall. So I just click one point on the point cloud and then it automatically puts me in a 2D view. So now we're looking in a top-down view or a plan view of the, the stairwell, and I can clearly see the outline of the walls. And now I'm just using our, our polyline fitting tool, clicking some points on that uh, on those walls to define that. I can hit the escape key and then say, okay, let's, let's close that curve. And now I can say, okay, what floor level am I on? I'm at P6, what type of wall I want to create? I have already measured this as a 140 millimeter wall. So that's, I've created that in there as a, as a new type. And then we click OK, and now it's fitted that wall using those uh, polylines that we used in the first place. So that's uh, quite a quick way or a quick workflow to, to start to generate walls like we had before. Uh, I used the clipping box manager to turn my point cloud back on again. And what I show now is just making some uh, adjustments to, to where that, that stairwell goes. So I'll just say, OK, well, this goes up to, to my P6 ceiling. So I'm just change, changing those constraints as well as down to the bottom, which how far down it goes as well. So that we can go, I'm setting my, my top constraint and now I'm setting my base constraint. I'm just saying P3, we can see down the bottom there that there's a, looks like there's some sort of room there, which is down the bottom, which we would have to take into account. But for this example, I think it works quite well that you can understand what I've done. So that's, um, that's some of the, the new tools that we've got. Excuse me. We also have, some other new tools. So again, using our, uh, our clipping box manager, I'm just zooming in on the area of interest. This, as you would expect, a stairwell has some doors. So uh, another new fitting tool that we have is to be able to fit doors and windows. So in this case, I've, I've changed to intensity view just to make it a little bit easier to, to understand what I'm looking at. I've changed the, the view to hidden view so I can see where my wall is and I've choose the door fitter. Uh, I can say use two points and I'm just going to pick two points diagonally, one in the, in this case, one in the top right hand corner. First, I have to pick which wall I want the door, the door to be fitted to because you need a, a wall to be able to create a door. And there we go. And in this case, I'm going to use the, one of the, the door types that are already there and click OK. And there we have it. There's our, our door fitted. So that is one of the, and like I said, we can use that, that, same, that same workflow for, for Windows as well. And then I've just turned out off the point cloud, that one button alone to be easily turn off a point cloud is really, really useful in CloudWorks. So in what we've just showed you, some of, the, some of the features, we've used the BLK to go and imported that into Cyclone Register 360. There also is the BLK edition, which you can use. Uh, and that's the prepare phase, then the manage collaborate phase. I showed creating an LGS file or a, a Jetstream project as well. And that's the, the manage collaborate phase. And then uh, we showed how you can use either of those workflows in Jetstream and CloudWorks, but using the Jetstream workflow just gives you more scope for collaboration. Um, and uh, which in this uh, current environment, collaboration is one of the, the buzzwords that everybody's using more so than ever, which is pretty good. So hopefully there we go. So there's been a lot of announcements made recently. Some of you uh, may not have heard them all. The first one is that we have a, a new publisher, Cyclone Publisher, which replaces the old Jetstream and TrueView publishers. So it's, uh, uh, you should still be able to choose 
publish those with the new publisher, but you can also now publish an RCP file and the LGS file. So that's uh, a new publisher which replaces Jetstream and, and TrueView publishers. Now, for those of you who have Publisher Pro, that's still the same. You can do exactly that, but there's some new features that we can now do. So things like we showed the clipping box manager, you can export points that are inside those clipping box clipping boxes, which is quite good. You can export the panoramic images as a, as a, a standalone image. We can export a LAS file, as well as some of the new features that are, excuse me, coming up in the future. Um, Publisher Pro will let you be able to, to generate those contents. And there's some, some really interesting things that are, that are coming up in the future. And one of those is to be able to uh, import a 3D model into Jetstream Viewer. So this little graphic should click over to the to my next slide, even to my next slide. So coming up soon, you'll be able to import 3D models into Jetstream Viewer. And uh, as we all know, this has some, some very useful possibilities to be able to do that. You'll be able to measure clearances and um, do clash detection and things like that just in the viewer itself. So, so that's coming soon. And that's definitely, definitely something to look forward to. Um, and like I said, uh, there's been a lot of changes that have been announced recently. I suggest speaking to your, to your local LICA representatives. Um, and that, uh, that ends my presentation tomorrow. All right, thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I'll take it from here. So um, certainly some interesting material there, Greg, in terms of collaboration and the, uh, forwards and backwards uh, direction of data flow with Jetstream Enterprise. What I wanted to talk about now is some potential applications for the BLK to go. I did a little bit of a brainstorming session myself and I tried to think of all the interesting applications that people might use this scanner for. I've come up with a, a short list here. I'm sure there's many more. Um, and there'll be some that people will do that uh, are really, really quite surprising, I expect. If anyone's got some ideas, feel free to post them in the comments. And also, if you've got any questions, um, feel free to ask them as well. I've seen a few questions coming through uh, and we'll do our best to answer them either during the presentation or at the end in our Q&A session. For me, most of the applications for this scanner would fit into the architecture, engineering and construction realm. Um, the obvious one would be scan to BIM or building feature surveys. Um, but of course, underground mining, the SLAM technology is particularly suited to that sort of environment. Uh, potentially earthwork stockpiles, DTMs, um, site progress, documentation, the next category I thought would be the media and entertainment. So things like uh, cinematography and set design, VR and AR, where you're trying to merge the real world with the virtual world and you need a, a really quick sensor to capture the, the data or environment around you. Some applications in asset management, I think, also uh, lease areas and potentially inventory mapping, insurance, like most laser scanners, the, there's obvious applications for the insurance industry. Um, security route mapping in a military sense, perhaps, and surveillance design. You can imagine quickly capturing an indoor environment to locate or design the location of surveillance cameras to make sure that everything is going to be covered. Generally speaking, this scanner, I think, is suited to areas that are traditionally difficult to survey. Areas that are confined or are very complex, when speed is important and when no site drawings exist, are all good candidates for this scanner. If we look a little bit closer at a couple of these applications, this slide just shows a couple of cross-section views of some data from the scanner. The first one on the left there is of a residential house. And although not extensive, you can see very quickly that it's picked up all the internal wall locations uh, and all the details are there to be ready to be modeled, whether that's through um, maybe Autodesk Revit or, or another modeling package. Of course, if you're working in the Leica ecosystem of software, you can benefit from 
uh, the Cloudworks plugins, and there's a number of Cloudworks plugins, uh, notably Autodesk Revit, AutoCAD, MicroStation, uh, and there's there's probably another seven or eight more Cloudworks plugins as well. This, this little uh, data set here was one I collected with the scanner recently. It was a skate park and also a little BMX track sitting off to the side. I thought I'll just extract the data from the BMX track and bring it into Cyclone 3DR and see if I can create a contour map and a DTM. For anyone not aware, Cyclone 3DR, by the way, is the new name for 3D Reshaper. Uh, so I took the data into Cyclone 3DR, extracted the point cloud, um, filtered out the ground surface, and then I did a 3D mesh across the ground. From that, I could generate a nice color plot of elevation and I could generate my contour lines. Another interesting application for this scanner, I think, is tree mapping. Uh, whether it's just to determine the location of trees or perhaps the trunk diameter. I did a little capture and um, this loop you can see in the green, green loop there on the right, that took probably no more than a minute. And I got all this information on where these trees are located. You could use this data to assess canopy size, uh, of course, tree location. I think it's got some good applications in the scientific research area as well. Uh, looking at things like biomass and density of the undergrowth and things like that. Okay, so that um, brings us to our third poll question. Thanks, Tamara. Thanks, Sam. Let me just load that up. Okay, so if you had a BLK to go today, what would you use it for? Please select all that apply. Creating 2D floor plans, creating 3D models, volume analysis, real estate applications, cinematography, or if it's something else, please feel free to note that in the um, chat box. We'll give you a few moments to answer. Sam, there's, a, there's been a, a lot of questions coming through, which is great to see, but um, some of those examples you, you just presented there, are, I think are really interesting, especially the, the tree and the forestry one. Um, it really is quite impressive how well the BLK to go works in, in that type of environment, actually. Yeah, no, there's obviously a lot of uh, many and varied applications for this scanner. So it'd be really inter interesting to see what people use it for, for sure. And like we saw with, uh, with the BLK360, there's been some, some really unusual and unique applications. I'm, so I'm sure we'll see that in this case as well. So we're almost, um, we're almost through with the presentation. I'll, wait for tomorrow to, to publish the results of the poll. Yes, so I'll close the poll now and let me share the results. Ah, that's interesting, 3D models, excellent. That's good to see. And I, and I think that's also a sign of the times that pr pretty well much everything related to reality capture is, is related to 3D these days, but there is still a, a lot of things which are done in 2D, but that, that's really good to see. Great. Okay, so while we give our presenters a few moments to gather the questions, I would like to um, notify you about our upcoming webinar. So we have a webinar on the May, on May 14th, um, looking at the MS60 and looking at the most recent features of the MS60. So we will be advertising this on our social media networks um, and we encourage you to participate in this as well. Also, if you need to get in touch with anyone in Australia and New Zealand, you can do so uh, by getting in touch with Leica Geosystems, our partner CR Kennedy and Global Survey. And we'll hand it over to our presenters now to go through some of the questions that we've received today. There's a few on the accuracy I can see already. Yes, no, there's been a lot of questions like that, but fantastic. Thanks for that, Tamara. Uh, I'll just reiterate, like I said, if you if you have any questions about the new software releases and, and whatnot, speak to your local Leica representative. So in, in Australia, that's uh, anyone from CRK, CR Kennedy, or in New Zealand, it's um, the people in Global Survey. Uh, there's been a lot of changes, especially related to, uh, to the Cyclone Publisher licenses. So I can highly recommend finding out the information on that. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed with the, the number of questions that we've had. There's, uh, there's a couple, for, like, a whole lot of questions. Benjamin's asked whether whether there's a, an example of download data sets. Definitely, Benjamin, there's a there's some on the Leica data sets that I'm sure you'll be able to get in contact with um, any of any any of the Leica representatives. We've, we're now starting to see a lot of different example data sets that uh, that you'll be able to get access to. Um, oh, Hughes asked how far away. Um, how far away can you scan? Uh, it's up to, to uh, 25 metres is, is the, the furthest the BLK to go can scan. And that probably leads us on, there's been a lot of questions about accuracy. Uh, we do state the accuracy in our, um, in our uh, brochures, um, which is 20 millimetre for the, for the absolute accuracy. And that's obviously in the, in the ideal environment, which is um, indoors where you have floors, walling and walls and ceilings. And we've got a, um, a number of tests where that, that's definitely proven. Um, so it works quite well. You can use control points. That's what um, a few other questions have, uh, have been raised. Can we use control points? And that's most definitely you can. The workflow is slightly different, um, but uh, in terms of that, you, that at the moment we're using spheres, but uh, that's definitely possible to, to put, the, put the BLK to go walks onto control. Um, Sam, do you have any questions? Yeah, I've got a few. Um, one of them that's come through is talking about, uh, let's see, um, the, the range of the scanner. So um, that's from half a metre up to about 25 metres from the scanner. Uh, what else have I got here? Uh, is the unit intrinsically safe for explosive environments? Uh, technically, no, it's not intrinsically safe. Uh, it's rated IP54. Um, and part of that question was also, can it be used in low light areas? Um, and will that, uh, will that uh, affect the, the accuracy of the data collection? Uh, it won't affect the accuracy, the SLAM, system will still work, the LiDAR will still work, but it will affect the imagery quality, of course. If you've got dark uh, dark areas, then the photos will come out quite dark. In terms of the LiDAR, no, that would still work work well. Correct, and that, that leads on to, um, Sam's asked a, a question about the vis and is it dependent on an ambient light? And that's correct. So obviously the vis is, is using um, video capture, so it does need lighting. But that's the, the reason why um, we've come up with the Grand Slam, which is the combination of, of Viz and SLAM. Obviously, SLAM works in, um, in, in different environments, uh, somewhere where you have a lot of geometry. SLAM works really well. Um, uh, and likewise, so when you don't have as much, much information, that's where something like the Viz uh, is designed to, to kick in. But as Sam, Sam, Sam Hesper just said, uh, for the for the Viz to be working, you do need some light, but that's where the SLAM's working because it's just dependent on what, what data's been captured. Um, what else, well, you, have you got any other, Sam? Yeah, I've got one here. Um, uh, someone has asked, once you've selected the number of points, the number of waypoints uh, in the software, so register 360, um, can this be changed later? Um, to answer that, you can change it later, but it would require you to re-import the data. So when you import the data, there's a setting and you specify the distance spacing uh, between adjacent waypoints. So you could choose anything, you know, you could choose one metre spacing or you could choose 5, 10, 20 metre spacing, whatever you see fit. If you needed to change it, you would have to re-import the data loop. Yep, and that, that actually raises an, uh, another, another point relating to importing data, there is a, a, a super fast workflow where um, if you're just really interested in the point cloud to say create a quick 2D floor plan, you can actually just say export or import that and go straight to an E57 format, for example. And that is almost taking uh, the same amount of time as to what the walk took. So if you, if you did a two minute walk, for example, it'd only take a couple of minutes to, to end up with an E57 file. So there's, um, there is some super fast workflows as well. I've got another question here. What's uh, um, Loretta's asked, what's the battery life? That's a really good question. It's about um, 45 minutes uh, and it does come, the unit does come with a, a couple of different 
a couple of batteries. So that is a lot of information that you would be capturing. Um, most of our walks have been around a couple of minutes and, and we're really surprised with, with how, much, how much information um, it's picking up. Uh, any other, Sam? Uh, yeah, uh, Hugh has asked, what's the fastest speed you should travel with a scanner? Good question. Um, good question. I, I'm not aware of a limit, Greg, are you? Yeah, there is, there is a limit, there yeah, is an yes. upper limit, uh, but in, uh, in theory you can actually, you know, you can run with the, with the BLK to go, and I've, I've tried that, and it, it does work, but obviously that starts to, to reduce the amount of the detail that you're capturing, so generally we'd say just a, a steady walking pace like you showed in, in your presentations, that's, that's an acceptable speed, and obviously the, the faster you go, the, the less detail you'll, you'll, be, you'll be capturing. There's another question here about custom mounting of the scanner, um, for example, onto a, onto a vehicle. Uh, I'm not aware of any custom mounts available. Uh, Greg, maybe you can confirm that, no, but it's really no. designed to be a handheld device. Exactly, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fit for purpose task is, um, is yeah, as a handheld device and scanning, typically scanning indoors. It can definitely be used outdoors. There's, there's no question about that, but obviously that depends on the, the geometry around you. So if you're on an airport runway, which is flat and has no geometry around, then that, that's not going to work. But um, yeah, there's, there's no plans for, for any sorts of um, accessories like that at the moment, because like you said, it's, its purpose is designed for, for walking. Um, what else do we have? File size. I've got, I've got, um, I guess a tip, um, which I've learned through using the scanner. Um, during the initial starting up of a survey or initialization, um, it's best performed in an area where you can see the surrounding walls and objects, um, because it's the the starting off of the slam. So you need, ideally, it's in a sort of a, a reasonably open room or open space. Uh, so that when you pick it up and start moving with it, um, it's it's already begun its tracking. I guess that's just a just a tip. Uh, it's not yeah. ideal to, for example, start in the back of a boot of a car, um, do the initialization in the boot, and then pull it out and start walking. It would be better to um, do it outside. Yep. I've got uh, two more questions. Uh, can we combine the, the uh, BLK to go scans with um, scan stations such as a P30 or P40? Most definitely, um, and it's it's effectively the, the same workflows that that Sam and I just showed, where you where you're performing cloud to cloud. Um, and then also, what is the file size like? The file size is actually quite good. Um, uh, it's uh, obviously the detail which you which you've seen in the examples we've presented is. Uh, the point resolution is not as fine as something like with an RTC 360 or a P series, so that's one of the reasons why the file size is much smaller. Um, uh, so the, the file sizes are actually not too bad, but if you were to to walk all day every day, um, or for the 45 minute battery life, then obviously that would be quite a large scan. But well, we wouldn't be recommending that. Have you got any other questions, Sam? I think we're almost ready to wrap uh, up. Look, I, yeah, I I think I've. There's a couple of questions that have sort of double up, doubled up here. Um, can't see any others right now. Yeah, so all of these questions that have been asked, we'll, we'll uh, send a response to as well once the once the presentation's been finished. But but definitely thanks for all the all the questions and um, uh, yeah, it certainly answer the the webinar question once once this is finished. Uh, probably one of the most important ones is uh, what other presentations would you would you like to see in future? Um, we definitely enjoy putting these together. Um, so yeah, anything else from your side tomorrow? So great, thank you guys. That's some great discussion there. So I think this concludes our webinar. Um, so thank you for attending. You will be receiving a follow-up email with a link to view re the recording of today's webinar. And as you exit today's webinar, please take the time to complete our short survey. We appreciate any feedback that you have on today's webinar and any upcoming topics you'd like to hear about. And on behalf of Leica Geosystems, C.R. Kennedy and our presenters, Sam and Greg, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Greg. Bye.